Hey everybody, welcome back to Cosmos. Uh, I've had a couple of exciting deliveries today and um, I thought I'd share what's arrived. Um, it's a, an interesting lathe modification and there are some other bits and pieces that uh, I'm sure you'll appreciate. And so that brings us now finally to the um, big package. It's from, uh, it's from MyFid UK, uh, sorry, My, from MyFid Limited. Uh, so MyFit, of course, being the manufacturer of uh, my lathe, and uh, it's a kind of new product, which is uh, very pleasing because um, you know the the game being what it is, there's not a lot of call really for a, a company like. My food, it was a lathe manufacturer to produce new ideas because the market is so limited. You know, it's it's, it's, uh, it's the market is is mostly uh, hobbyists and um, model engineers and the like. You know, it's not it's not a flourishing in, it's not exactly a flourishing industry anymore. Um, so it's a very sturdy double walled box. Various, various bits. There's, uh, there's that. Uh, that's packing. That's packing. Uh, there we go. So what we have. is a rack operated tailstock attachment. That's quite nicely presented. Uh, says, if you ever need to take this attachment apart, please be careful when removing the dial. There is a strong spring with a very small bearing and care must be taken or damage may be caused. <laughs> and so what we have there is a, is a stop collar, three ball handles, more packaging, or more uh, kind of wadding, polystyrene, and that's the key bit. And a cross, cross piece, which goes like that, exactly that orientation on the lathe, uh, and that's just the box. And so, what it is, is if I slide this interview, which is the tail stuff for my lathe. This item is, or this this new piece of tooling that MyFed have made available, is an improvement or upgrade to the standard tailstock. Now, this uh, rack operator tailstock attachment can be used, I think, on some Super Sevens, on all two five fours, etc. Uh, so basically, all the lathes that share common tailstock barrel. Oh yes, and that's the other thing that I haven't opened yet, is the replacement barrel. Now, I will, I will go for the fitting and installation of this in another video. But just to briefly summarize how it works. So there we have a beautiful new tailstock barrel. And so we have a couple of keyways here. There's a keyway and there is another shallower keyway by the look of it. That's about the same. Another one in the back and then a rack. 
with the teeth milled straight into the um, into the body of there. So basically, what we have here is a classic lathe tailstock with a tapered bore in the barrel, and the way it, it's uh, it's operated is that there's a this this works as a nut. So at the at the at the inside end of this uh, barrel is a is a threaded section, which is in fact a bronze insert, and attached solidly or bod bodily to this uh, hand wheel is a male threaded rod and, and the pair are uh, threaded with Acme threads which are good uh, driving threads so they have incredible uh, ability to drive forward and so if I just spin that out the nut will float free and this is well lubricated thanks to these three little oilers, one, two, and in fact that little oiler lubricates the, um, the bushing for the, for the hand wheel. And so what we have there, just about see the light, and there's a little, there's a little brass plug that just um, protects the end of the feed screw from any uh, steel taper tooling. So what you have here is a tapered bore, so that's, that's an, a female cone. Uh, and at the other end, you have that bronze nut, uh, which is why this can drive forward, forward and back against the concealed male thread that uh, that spins around inside the the back of the tailstock. I'm going to put the little uh, brass block back in, and so here I have a classic uh, sort of uh, taper piece of tooling. In this case, we have a Jacobs drill chuck. This is a two morse taper, so that refers to the size of the taper. You get one morse taper which is smaller and lighter, three, four, five morse taper on very big lathes. The idea of the tapered shank is that as the two parts mate together, the more you apply a force at the, at the, at the large end of the taper, the more you drive those two cones into each other, and without requiring any kind of positive link, uh, there's an incredibly tight communion between them, uh, such that you can uh, have very large drill bits, and in fact traditional and, and, and good quality engineering practice would still be to use a tapered shank drill bit uh, where the drill itself, the, the, the tail end of the drill, is, is, a t is a taper that fits straight into the shank without requiring the use of, a, of any sort of chuck. And so the, w the way that the, um, the piece of tooling is extracted is basically to use the, th the, the power of the thread to drive it out like that. And you see it popped out there because the thread bumped it. And you, you need a relatively light force to disengage the two tapers, whereas it takes an incredible force uh, to make them slip on each other, which is why taper tooling is so so beautiful. But in use, it'd be very irritating if that slipped out of engagement while you were trying to drill, because then the whole chuck would spin, and and and, and you know the uh, the male would spin in the female taper and cause all sorts of uh, untidy engineering problems. So it's pretty tedious to drive the hand wheel forward and drill and then back again to clear the chips and forward again and back again and then any any piece of tooling you put in has to be withdrawn on the, on the tailstock and then you can take it out. Look, it's what they call a first world problem, okay? It's, it's, not, it's not the end of the world, but it can become tedious if you're drilling lots of holes or, you know, you have a lot, a lot of tailstock work to do. And that's what this upgrade is all about. So you can see that the replacement barrel is considerably longer than the original barrel. So that's, that's the original with this little bron uh, brass insert there. That's the replacement, a long old thing. It's got exactly the same taper there. And you can look all the way down it. And so the design of this uh, tailstock barrel harks back to a slightly older fashioned way of doing things. So in much older fashioned lathes the outboard end of this uh, hand wheel was, was bored through and there was a hole 
clear through the whole thing, um, allowing you to drive the taper out with a striker rod. So you, you just have a bar which you, 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 you jam in and it pops the piece of taper tooling out. And uh, the diameter of the threaded section, uh, say in, in, in an old-fashioned lathe, the, the thread would be a male thread on the large diameter of this, of this barrel uh, with the, the nut or the, being the driving part which is attached that to the hand wheel or basically the hand wheel had the, the thread made in that uh, center boss. So you had a much larger diameter but it, it wasn't quite as, um, as efficient because the threads were exposed and so constantly got uh, full of swarf and, and chips and uh, eventually most lathe makers re uh, revised their designs to the concealed thread there which kind of precluded the use of this striker bar which is just a plain rod that you could pop all the way through and just bash the, the, the taper tooling out so in an older fashioned lathe You'd have the piece of taper tooling in the, in the, in the, in the nose and, and you'd have the striker bar which you just use to drive the taper out. In practice there'd probably be a slightly heavier back on this uh, with a knurled end or something just to give it a little bit of a uh, mess. Right, so the upgrade. What we have here is this component which is a uh, right angle casting and it basically fits onto the onto the tailstock in exactly that um, orientation so you have a, a through bore there and, and you might be able to see within the bore that this component has um, has a wheel or, or a gear just in there and that's what engages with these uh, these uh, milled teeth in the in the in the barrel. So by spinning this, you would drive this barrel forward and backward. So I'll insert this just as a test, and of course it's not oiled or anything. And I'll just give it a kind of dry run. Uh, we need to. Hmm. And in fact, there's no key there. Yeah, so it doesn't appear to be a key in that bore. So it just said it should just, should just drive straight in. So what I will do is take one of the, um, the ball handles. Uh, and of course I seem to have lost my knife. Trusty scissors instead. So we'll just temporarily insert that just to give us some leverage. Right. Ah, oh, that's interesting. Right, so the threads don't go all the way to the end. Hello, genius. Okay, so obviously I need to do something differently. I need to take that. Uh, how does that work? Okay. All right. When in doubt, stop and think. So I've got the old um, Allen keys there. Uh, what is that? Look, one eight. It's always one bigger or smaller than the one you first pick up. So seven sixty fourths. What's that like? No. Oh, is it? Yes, it is. Right. So we free the grub screw. That's a nice uh, black <coughs> black and collar. A little recess for the uh, for the grub screw, and so we pull that threaded element. I mean, not the threaded, but the uh, the geared element out. 
and it does appear to have been there's some marks on the gears but I wonder if that's just not for me meshing it oh no it's not because the marks actually descend into the um, dedendum of the gear teeth no matter they they appear to be fine and in fact these gears will tend to only engage on the center line so and these strain marks are not on the center line so no matter um, I think it went that way yes so we first insert the bar we then insert that and engage the teeth and then we reapply our little collar You know what, I've got a sneaking suspicion that this is a metric fitting. It's classic late British engineering of this type where you've got mixed mixed fastenings. Beautiful. Metric and imperial fastenings all on the same machine tool. Fantastic. Okay, so it's, it's a bit juddery at the moment because we're not working in the right orientation, but you can see how that hand wheel will drive pretty quickly uh, the advance of this, uh, of this bar. So it's, it's got quite a rapid lead. Um, so in fact, rather than do all these uh, virtual assemblies, I'm going to see if I can just assemble the whole thing. Let's just spin that out. Right. Okay. Uh, Whoops, oh, there goes the little ball that the instructions warned me not to lose. But I didn't quite expect this uh, collar to drop right out. And there is the little spring. So let's be careful not to lose anything else now. Yeah, there's a little spring there. With a little ball that takes into a groove or recess in the um, in that collar. So what is that about? Oh, so that's so that you can zero the reading. That is so you can zero the um, that's like a, a, an adjustable micrometer stop. Okay, so I'm going to remove that spring, and in fact, from my um, For my flea market video, I've got my little magnetic yellow pot or, or dish that will allow me to hopefully not lose those components because they hold on with a magnet. Okay, so we've got these components. I'll just set them aside for the moment because what I want to do now is figure out how to remove this hand wheel off the tailstock. This C spanner. Uh, came with those machine jacks um, referred to in an earlier video and around the sort of invisible end of this barrel there is a, a little hole just under my thumb into which the C-spanner is designed to go but we have a little grease nipple there or oiler and they're not like the North American Zerks because they don't screw in and I've already tried them previously with a pair of pliers. Now I know I'm not going to... I don't think that there's a realistic prospect of me reusing any of these components but I don't necessarily feel it's right to, to mash up um, an existing component. The thing is I can't get the spanner square to the work if you like. I might not need to, but I kind of have to pass this little this little oiler. I'm going to reinstall this on the lathe, uh, which will give me some leverage. Right, so I've installed the tailstock on the lathe. I'll see if I can just give it a whack and, and free this, uh, this threaded section. Oh, that was very easy. Okay. Right. 
Right, so back at the workbench, uh, it's it's pretty obvious how um, this uh, this new casting attaches because there is a a thread, um, a male thread, and a kind of lock nut as far as I can tell, and so we assume that there's a similar arrangement back here. So we just undo that. And there must be some kind of bearing in there because this uh, this spins and there's a there's a little oiler. So assume there's a there's a bearing surface uh, on the inner bore of the steel collar. And there's a good sign, a kind of yellowish stain of mineral oil. Mineral mineral oil. Wow, look at that. Wow. What a beauty. Let's have a look at that. I've never had this apart before. Um, and so the first thing that strikes one is pretty pleased with my own maintenance regime of this uh, of this lathe. There are a few little chips here, but they're of an appreciable size, which is perhaps more tolerable than a kind of fine sludge, which would be more akin to grinding paste. Um, and so what we see is this yellowish cast over everything, which is in fact spindle oil. I think I've said it in one of my other videos that um, I have slowly adopted an aversion to the use of any kind of animal or vegetable oils on any of my machines. The reason is that they rancidify, they go off. And when an animal or a vegetable oil goes off, the long chain molecules, the polymers, cross-link. So it's like having a big pot of spaghetti. Uh, it's kind of sloshy when it's wet, but if you leave it to, to, to just settle and, and dry out, it becomes a rubbery mess because wherever the strands touch, they fuse. Um, and that is what happens when uh, you expose oil like, um, okay, olive oil is a good example. Not that we'd use olive oil on our lathe, but olive oil is often touted in, in, in engineering circles or, say, horological circles as a good cutting fluid. Well, maybe, but it's going to go rancid on all the parts where it's left. And when it does, when it's exposed to the, to the air, the long chains will bind to each other and form varnish. And varnish cannot be taken off with a solvent. It has the, 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 the cross-link polymers have to be broken chemically. And that's what a paint stripper is. And so definitely no animal or vegetable oils on any of my machines anymore. Only beautiful synthetic or mineral oils. So oil that gets pumped out of the ground, nothing else. So what we have here is, ah, oh, it's a thrust bearing, yeah. So it's probably not visible at this scale, but there's a thrust bearing in there that you can see the little balls. Um, I'm not sure if they're balls or pins. Uh, in fact, they're balls, uh, which is what gives a, a beautifully smooth feel to this tailstock. So in a way, I feel quite, kind of quite wistful about abandoning this because it is beautifully made. And so this section in my left hand is fixed in space because it's screwed into the casting there. Um, and then the tailstock wheel is spun. But any thrust coming from any cutting forces, uh, because don't forget, you'd have the chuck ultimately bearing against that point. I know it doesn't physically bear against that point, but the force is transmitted through the tailstock barrel into this threaded rod. So you've got a force directed straight down towards the tailstock from, from all the cutting forces uh, of, say, a drill. And all those forces are absorbed by this thrust bearing here. Um, and so 
the tailstock hardly feels it because all that force is taken up by those uh, polished balls in the thrust bearing. So that's it. So in theory, this piece, this whole assembly will be abandoned. Perhaps not entirely. I will have to play with the lathe with this new fitting and see if I enjoy using it or not. And so, I just give a quick inspection. Yeah, that looks pretty good. I'm going to experiment with my um, with my oil gun. All right, so what we have here is a classic oil gun, and this this is a Swiss one uh, which I bought in. Um, uh, I can't remember now. Um, Realtools.ch. I can't remember the town. It's oh, I think it's Bevillard or Bevillard, which is the town where. No, it's not Bevillard. It's the town where uh, there's a machine tool dealer there. Not Luthi, but. Uh, Uh, it escapes me. It escapes me. It'll co it'll come back to me. Uh, oh, there we go. Thirty three point three five francs. So thirty three francs and thirty five. Uh, whatever the Swiss hundredth of a franc is, which is uh, it's a weird. Ah, oh, you see, my my brain is completely failed. I can't remember the town name, and I cannot remember the one hundredth of a Swiss franc. So. Please forgive me, all you Swiss viewers. And so, let's just see what happens when we pump the oiler. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah, that, that works pretty well. I've always wanted to see that in action because I was never convinced that these things work. Because I reckon for every squirt of oil you give, you know, half a squirt of oil comes out of all these joints the thing is terribly terribly badly sealed and the whole thing is always covered in oil um, even a good Swiss one like this so I recently acquired uh, just as a as an aside recently acquired one of these Rylang oilers well a few of them in fact it says made in Germany oh wow that's interesting. This one says made in Switzerland. Hergestellt der Schweiz. Swiss made, Rylang. But in fact, the other one. Look at that. Look. Made in Germany. That's also Rylang, although a slightly different style. Uh, these are meant to be great. Uh, I've yet to put them into service. But one of the things that I like about them is that they have a, a return so that any oil that drips down the outside of this wand or this uh, this tube ultimately finds its way back into the vessel rather than all over the outside of every single thing in the vicinity. Anyway, I digress. Let's continue with this installation. I'm going to poke a finger down there and just feel, yeah, that's a bit crummy there. Oops. I seem to cover the camera in, uh, in filth. So let's just... Let's give it a squirt. So what I'm using here is, um, is slideway oil. You know, I think the exact grade of oil is less important than one's cleanliness regimen when it comes to machine tools. Um, I mean, if you keep the machine regularly and freshly oiled, then the exact type of oil you use is going to be less and less important over time. There are considerations. So, for example, one wouldn't want to use uh, modern motor oil, that's um, a detergent oil, 
because the effect of that is to keep any particles in suspension and that's what is not wanted in a machine what is wanted is for the particles to fall out of suspension whereas in a car they stay in suspension so that they can be carried to the to the uh, oil filter in a machine we don't want that because there is no such thing as an oil filter on uh, on a lathe of this type uh, I'm feeling reluctant to use my new uh, gun barrel cleaning uh, rod. Anyway, I think that's I think that'll do. Everything seems pretty pretty tidy down there. There's no apparent scoring or wear marks. The construction of the of this uh, type of lathe is, is is pretty high grade. So, for example, the the lock is a proper cotter, a split cotter. And what that is is uh, you've got. In fact, I'll probably be able to remove it. Yes. And so that is a good old-fashioned split cotter. I'll just want to give that a wipe. And so what we have. Oh, why is my finger full of black? Where did that come from? Yeah, there's always going to be wear in that area, and in fact, I might remachine this because that's no good. I'm just going to re disassemble this thing. That's not too black. Okay, so a classic cotter has a fixed element which just floats in, in, a, in, a, in a through hole. So that thing goes all the way through. But you'll notice that it has a sort of part of a circle bored into one side of it. Then it's got a sliding sleeve that just fits over the plain shank there. You'll see there's a, there's a threaded section and a plain shank. And of course, this, um, this diameter is a nice smooth fit in that hole. Okay, so it just slides just, just nice and cleanly. Um, and then that slides over that. So all of that is kind of free floating and the whole thing is free floating in that hole that I showed you earlier. And if you look at the the shape that's uh, milled into this zone here, at a certain distance apart they form part of a curve. And that curve corresponds to whichever diameter they are trying to clamp. So I think this is, I don't know, an inch and something and so that, in theory, would be a nice fit on this shape, okay? Which means that the slightest amount of compression or bringing these two together will pinch this barrel really snug snugly in its hole. And so it's an incredibly effective way of locking a moving barrel. And the other thing is it doesn't tend to cant the barrel over too much, which um, if you had, say, a grub screw or a, a screw pressing from the side, would tend to bias the whole thing uh, in, in a more pronounced way than this, which, which tends to wedge from, from two sides. Um, and so, of course, it does drive the barrel upwards because the, 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 the two forces, if you would, are, are driving towards the center line of the of the barrel and so there is a, a net resultant force upwards but it's balanced across uh, two sides of the center line uh, and then of course the pinching action is done by this little ball handle here but you will notice that there's a lot of it's not quite scoring but it's 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 a very untidy And I wouldn't be surprised if a previous owner of this machine damaged that. So I might, I might revisit this. I might 
put a boring head or something through there and just round off those faces again because I don't like that at all. It's not it's not clean. But in any event, that literally just slips in there. And so the way the thing is held in is once the um once the barrel's in place and you have to make sure that there's enough light before you assemble it, otherwise the barrel won't insert itself into that hole. Right, so we're ready for assembly. So the, co the cotter's back in place. Uh, what do we want next? I think we need this casting next. Uh, which way around does it go? Yes. So we pull the lock nut back. The blue hand Luke here, I decided to, to have a little pause and go and find my um, my copper grease. Now I know this stuff is really designed for, for high temperature applications like engines where you, you might want to apply it to your sparking plugs to stop them binding in the cylinder block, but uh, it, it can't, it can't, uh, it can't harm. To, to have them on these threads which are going to be unscrewed very infrequently and well you saw how easily the threads are uh, unlocked off the uh, the original tailstock uh, drive wheel there but I fancy just putting a, a smidgen of this copper grease on it's an anti, it's an anti seize or anti binding type of grease of course yeah. <laughs> I have to double check what I'm doing because it is made by Loctite uh, and I had to be sure not to use actual Loctite which does the opposite as uh, bind the parts inseparably together forever um, and of course this isn't the f this isn't the first time th that I've uh, that, I, that I couldn't find my copper grease and so this is my very old tube of copper grease looks like it looks like a, a, a tube of glue uh, like old-fashioned kind of school glue and I couldn't no in fact the last time I needed some I looked at it and it was all dried out and so you can actually see I've this 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 header here is completely dried out like a, a solid cake and so I sliced it off and sliced another section and then just started mashing a bit uh, and so the last time I tried to use this stuff thought it had dried out too much for the, the purpose I required, bought some more and I for the life of me cannot find that tube of copper grease, the fresh tube and it's it's a it's a it's a proper tube like a like a toothpaste tube and but I can't find it. So anyway I've I managed to dig down more deeply into this uh, kind of glue stick arrangement and, and, and found some fresher material. So I'll just wipe that onto a few of the threads and they will of course work their way around as I as I thread it, this uh, this component on and I think that's enough we only need a few molecules if any so we'll just get this out of the way because this is the sort of thing that spreads absolutely everywhere and so we'll dispose of it really early on in the game